jury selection is also getting underway this morning in Flagler County, Florida, near Daytona Beach, Florida, and it's going to be Court TV's next live trial starting tomorrow morning with opening statements. The defendant in this case, Keith Johansson, is charged with first degree murder for killing his wife, Brandy Salinza. That's according to the state. Johansson says, ah, no, his wife shot herself. That's in 2018, the state claims that the shooting was the culmination of an ongoing domestic violent dispute between the couple. The victim's six-year-old son was at home at the time of the shooting. And during the trial, we do expect to learn more about the, what the son witnessed and was able to tell investigators around the time of the incident. Now, opening statements are expected to begin tomorrow morning for the trial. We'll bring them to you live. One of the critical pieces of evidence in this case is the 911 call that Johansson placed on April 7th, 2018, when he claimed to have discovered his wife's dead body next to their bed. Listen closely. We're going to play the whole thing for you. It's, it's quite lengthy, but when you're done listening to it, you'll understand why, why after this 911 call was made, investigators or suspicious. Roger County 911, where's your mention? Yes, may I have an officer over at 23 Helter Lane? 23 what? Helter Lane. F E O T E R? Yes. Okay, what's going on there? Um, I was in the shower. I heard gunshots. I think my wife shot her. What happened? I was in the tower and I heard some gunshots. Okay. I think that my wife accidentally shot herself. Do you see her? Yes. Oh, is she, where did she shoot herself? Looks like in my bedroom. Where did she shoot herself bodily? I don't know. I can't see it. What do you actually see? She's laying down, laying next to the bed. Where is she bleeding from anywhere? I don't see it. I don't see blood. Okay. Do you see a gun on the floor or anything? Yes, I ain't moving it. What kind of gun? It is a 9mm. Okay, do you see any head wound? Did she shoot herself or anything in the head? I need somebody to page it out for me. Do you see anything in the head? No. All right, do you see any, can you, have you tried waking her up? Do you see any, any part of her body where she got shot that you can possibly apply pressure? I can't see anything. Yeah, right in the ribs it looks like. Okay. You see a wound like in the rib wound, like, like, like in the chest, upper chest, lower chest? Oh, um, the upper chest. Upper chest? Do you, do you think she did this to harm herself, or do you think this was accidental? Any idea? No. No, I think it's accidental. You think it's accidental? Correct. Okay, is she breathing? She's talking to you, breathing anything? Yes, she's breathing. All right. Is she able to say anything to you? Baby. Hey. Baby, no. She thinks you'll hear it. Okay. I can hear her breathe, though. She's hurry. All right, sir, stay in the line a second, okay? I think maybe I got more freedom All right, stay in the line, sir. Let me get an ambulance going, okay? Please hurry. Please stay for us. We will. We will. Just stay in the line with me, okay? Please hurry. We are. Baby, please stay with us. Bring an ambulance. There's an ambulance on the way. We will. Just stay in the line. Violet, stay here. What's your name, sir? My name is Mr. Keith Johansson. Medical injured person, 23 Felter Lane, 23 Felter Lane. Rescue 21, engine 24. Rescue 21, engine 24. Reference. Please. Got shot one. Shut up. It's right next to him. Stay here. Okay. No, he didn't. He didn't touch the gun, right, sir? Huh? He did not touch the gun? No. Okay. What is your name again? 
My name is Mr. Keith Johansson. First name, first name only. Keith. Keith Johansson? Yes. Okay. Are you applying pressure to that wound? I'm thinking there's two guns on the floor. And I'm thinking that maybe she dropped them when she was trying to put them away. So you think she may have dropped them? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, can you apply for, are you applying pressure to that wound? No, I can't find yourself like that. I'm wet. I'm sliding on my floor. You can't apply pressure. I can't see it. Listen, I got wood floors and I'm sliding. I don't want to risk hurting her or possibly one of the guns going off too. Okay, but you can't, you can't reach down to her and apply pressure on the gun, on the gunshot wound. No, I can't see it. No, no, I can't. Okay. There's too much stuff right here. Too much stuff like... In. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. But there's no way for you to apply... What I'm trying to do is to see if there's any way to apply pressure to keep that blue wound from bleeding out. I don't see no blood on the floor. I just see blood on her shirt. Okay, but there's probably... There might be a gunshot wound there, sir. So I just wanted to see if you can apply pressure there, but you can't do that. Okay. Are you two alone in the house? Huh? Are you two alone in the house? Me and my kid. How old is your kid? Well, it's her kid, too. He is six. Please hurry. We are. We're on our way. We're, me asking you questions, Steve, is not slowing anybody down. All right? They're getting there as fast as they can. All right? Is what, what is around your wife that you can't get close access to her? Okay. I'm moving the bed. Okay. All right. Uh, is that front door open? Because I have a law enforcement that's pulling up on scene. Um, no, but do you want me to open it? Yeah, go get the law enforcement officer, okay? Okay. All right. Are you by the door? Yes, sir. Do you, see, do you see the police out there? Yes, sir. All right, go talk to the police. Please go talk to them, okay? Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, could not um, help out there and, and apply pressure to his dying wife because he was wet and slippery and um, just not able to do that. That, of course, raised some red flags with anybody who listens to that. Former criminal defense attorney Lauren Prater is with us. She's in Jacksonville, Florida. And Karen Felicia Nance is in San Francisco. Lauren, um, this doesn't, I mean, the jury is going to be thinking the same thing that the 911 operator was thinking. Um, what do you mean you can't help her? This doesn't help him. Uh, yeah, and my husband's out there watching somewhere. If I'm dying somewhere, he better put pressure on me. I don't care <laughs> what's there. He needs to move whatever is there. I mean, this is your wife or even just a human in general. Isn't it just our natural tendency to want to help unless there's a reason that you don't want the person to survive? So, I, I mean, this obviously sent off all the appropriate red flags. He's, you know, taking him, he, you know, he's not really concerned about her well-being. I don't, I don't know if there's blood. I don't see blood. Um, you know, he's saying, I never touched the gun. If you walk in on your wife laying on the floor, possibly dead of a gunshot wound, the last thing I'm thinking about is culpability. I'm thinking about the person that's there and how they, and, and, and how, how to keep, keep them alive. So I, uh, this is, this is extremely incriminating for me. I, I was making faces the whole time listening to it. So I'm interested to see how a jury, uh, abuse it as well. Karen, the, the, the state alleges that while this was going on, he was running around the house, getting rid of, uh, some, things that he didn't want investigators to find. And he may not have even been in the same room um, saying, oh, I can't, I'm wet from my shower. It's very slippery here. Uh, uh, that, but a, a juror, to Lauren's point, isn't gonna, under, just like we don't understand, right? This is bad because a juror is gonna have a tough time. How do you explain that away, that behavior? He's, he's going to need an excellent defense attorney to help <laughs> 
<laughs> with this situation because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, logically, it makes no sense. And the questions, the, the when he makes the call, the 911 call, they're asking very specific questions. Do you see blood? Do you see this? Do you see that? And he's having trouble even remembering his name at points. And so he sounds very discombobulated. And you would think he would also be concerned about his child. It just seems, uh, I think, the more the jury hears this this tape, and I, I think that would be a great strategy to play this over and over and, and just pick it apart and say, this this doesn't make any sense, that there's culpability on the part of, 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 of him as the husband, definitely. We also know that the six-year-old apparently told investigators immediately after that uh, that uh, dad basically lies all the time. Um, how difficult is it to bring a child into a criminal defense uh, who's lost his mother? Um, it, 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 Lauren, it, it's dicey, is it not? And sometimes jurors take offense to prosecutors making a child victim get up in a horrible situation at trial. If done, it has to be done um, with a lot of nuance, does it not? Absolutely. Uh, when you're dealing with child witnesses, uh, you need to make sure that you are, as a prosecutor or and as a defense attorney, you need to handhold them and walk them through it, especially at, at such a young age. Uh, you know, these are traumatizing moments. You need to show an extreme amount of empathy. Um, and, and you have to be very cognizant of, of the emotional state of the child while they are on the stand. So you need to walk them through it, you need to be clear, you need to be kind, and you need to be effective. So it takes a very skilled uh, questioning, set of questioning, in order to get the information you need out effectively and without offending the juror and without truly riling up the child to the extent that they are no longer an effective witness. Yeah, we'll see how that is handled by the state um, as this as this progresses, we again expect openings to begin tomorrow around 9 o'clock Eastern Time, and we'll have them for you right here on Court TV.